Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in this lecture of guitar amplification and effects, we're going to look at one possible design of a wah pedal circuit, also known as a wah-wah pedal circuit. Although one of the original patents about these kinds of effects called it a wow-wow effect. There are several ways to build such a circuit. The style of circuit we're going to look at today is based on inductors. And this is a little strange. Although inductors are very common in radio frequency circuits, they're not very common in audio circuits because the amount of inductance you need to be useful in an audio circuit can be a little bit unwieldy, and that leads people to try to design circuits that only use resistors and capacitors. And out of the classic trio of passive two-terminal elements, resistors, inductors, and capacitors, although resistors are typically the most ideal, inductors are arguably the least ideal. Computing the voltage transfer function of various combinations of resistors, capacitors, and inductors is a standard exercise in many electrical engineering classes. In particular, if you put an inductor, a capacitor, and a resistor in series, you can build a second-order transfer function. And depending on where you tap the output, you can get various combinations of low-pass, band-pass, and high-pass responses. So the goal of a wah-wah pedal is to provide a way for the musician to sweep the center frequency of a bandpass-ish transfer function using their feet. A challenge arises in that the natural frequency of these transfer functions tends to just have the inductance and the capacitance in the natural frequency. And although variable capacitors do exist, as seen in old amateur radios, they are pretty awkward. And you don't even want to dream about variable inductors for this application. We would really like to use simple, plain old potentiometers. The key is to use feedback. We know from control theory that we can use feedback to move around the poles and zeros of a system. The most common inductor-based design that I am aware of has a frequency-dependent core that consists of a capacitor with an inductor and a resistor in parallel. So the input is over here on the left and the output is over here on the right. So this parallel combination of the inductor and the resistor, that's going to have an impedance of RLS over R plus LS. So the actual transfer function of this circuit, let me call it big H RCL, is going to be RLS over R plus LS, so that's the impedance of this branch of our voltage divider, over 1 over CS, which is the impedance of the capacitor, plus RLS plus R plus LS. Let's see, I want to clear out the fraction here, so I'll multiply the numerator and the denominator by R plus LS, that will give me RLS in the big numerator. Then I'll have R plus LS over CS here on the left. And then I'll have RLS down here. All right, so now I'd like to get rid of the S in the denominator down here. So how about let me multiply the numerator and the denominator by S. This S will go away. I'll get a squared here and then I'll wind up with an S squared here. So to get this in my canonical form, let me divide by RL in the numerator and the denominator. So I'll wind up with an S squared in the numerator. When I divide by RL on this term, I'll wind up with an S squared. And then as far as my LS over C term here, goes when I divide by RL, I'll wind up with S over RC. And then for this term here with the R over C, when I divide by RL, I'll wind up with 
1 over LC. I think I did that right. I hope I did that right. And actually, instead of RCL, how about I call this RLC? That's a little more conventional. HRLC. All right. So I have an S squared in the numerator. So this is a strict second order high pass filter. So it has two zeros at the origin and it has a couple of poles. Now, where the poles are depends on the inductance and the capacitance, but not the resistance. So what we're gonna do is we're actually going to take this and use feedback on it, but not with this in the feed forward part. We're actually going to put this HRLC in the feedback loop itself. This is somewhat reminiscent of what Don Buchla did with the Buchla 191 sharp cutoff filter, where he developed a low-pass filter by taking a high-pass filter and putting that in the feedback loop of an op-amp style circuit. In the calculations that follow, I'm going to utilize Black's feedback formula. If you're unfamiliar with this, I suggest you check out the lecture I made on the topic for my ECE 3084 signals and systems class. That lecture also discusses the Buchla 191 sharp cutoff filter if you're interested. The main gain stage and the wah pedals I'm thinking about use a BJT configured as a common emitter amplifier. So that's an inverting stage. So I'm going to write that as a gain of minus capital A. So then I'm going to have a feedback loop where I'm going to include another factor here that is a factor of B. And this is what the guitar player actually changes with their foot. So I'll have that conceptually feed our RLC circuit up there in the corner, big H R L C S. And this is the input and this is the output. So if you're putting this on a schematic, this would actually be flipped around. And this is summed at the front here. So it looks a little something like this. I have an input coming in here, and then I have an output coming out that direction. Now this most closely matches the underlying circuit, and I'll show you the actual circuit in a little bit, but I like to think about it this way. I can take this minus sign here and pull it out and imagine that I have a minus here and that I have a minus here. So now it's more obvious that this is negative feedback and the whole structure just happens to be inverting. All right, so what is the closed loop transfer function going to be? We're going to have a minus sign in front of the whole thing because there's a minus sign sitting here. But Black's feedback formula will tell us we'll have an A in the numerator and then a 1 plus A, B times big H, R, L, C in the denominator. And actually, let me squoosh all this over in order to make some room. Okay, so I'll have minus A all over 1 plus A, B, and then in the numerator and the denominator, I'll have S squared, and then I have S squared plus S over R, C plus 1 over L, C. And now I'm going to do something that you'll find fairly familiar if you do any feedback control. I'm going to take the numerator and the denominator here and multiply it by this stuff down here. So in the numerator, I'll now have A times S squared plus S over RC plus one over LC. And then in the denominator, I'll have that S squared plus S over RC plus 1 over LC, all plus ABS squared. All right, so now let me combine the S squared terms. So the numerator is still the same. AS squared plus S over RC. Everybody is probably tired of me writing this. All right, now I'll have 1 plus a, B, S squared, and then plus my S over R, C, plus 1 over L, C. And I want to get this in my canonical form. So what I want to do is I want to divide the numerator and denominator by this 1 plus A, B. 
let's see. So now I'll have minus a over 1 plus ab. Let's imagine that we have that sitting out in front. And then I'll have s squared plus s over rc plus 1 over lc. See, when I'm doing equations like this, this will probably work better with PowerPoint, but this is more fun. All right, so I'll have s squared. Actually, instead of putting the parentheses down here, let me put these parentheses around here like this so we don't get confused about what's where. Let's see, and then I'll have s over 1 plus ab times rc. Ooh, I really need more space, don't I? You know what that means? It's time for more squooshing. Squoosh. Isn't this fun? All right, so then the last term I have 1 over 1 plus AB LC. Woo! All right, and what was this? This is the closed loop transfer function. Okay, so this is a pretty complicated transfer function. The main thing I want to point out is that the natural frequency is this term here, or more to the point, this term is the square of the natural frequency. So the actual natural frequency is going to be square root of 1 over 1 plus AB times LC. So by changing B, the amount of feedback, the musician is changing the natural frequency. So notice that the transfer function has two zeros and it has two poles. The zeros are stationary, but the poles change location as B changes. It is instructive to figure out what the gain at DC is. So if we plug in zero for S, basically, we're plugging in J omega for S to get a frequency response and we plug in zero for omega. Well, these terms here disappear, and this 1 plus AB will then cancel with that 1 plus AB, and then this 1 over LC cancels with this 1 over LC, and then we're just left with minus A. I will leave further analysis of this transfer function as an exercise for the viewer. All right, so at this point you might be asking yourself, well, how do real wah-wah pedals actually implement this circuit? I should give you a bit of warning that I'm being a little sloppy here in that to really implement what an actual wah-wah pedal typically does and model that correctly, I would need to put another transfer function here in front, but that would just multiply this HCL. And here I really wanted to focus on the part of the frequency response that changes as the musician uses the wah-wah pedal. I'll talk about this issue a little bit more later. So before I dig into those details, I want to cite my sources. GeoFX is the website of R.G. Keen, who is the OG of guitar effects analysis. And his website is an absolute goldmine of information. Of interest today is his article on the technology of wah pedals. So I would definitely recommend checking out this article. The other place to go for analysis of effects pedals is the ElectroSmash website. In particular, there's some analysis here of the Dunlop Crybaby pedal that's relevant to what we're talking about today. And there's also some analysis of the Vox Wawa pedal, one particular model, the V847, which is the subject of the analysis that I'm doing today. Both of these websites were instrumental in me developing my own understanding of the circuit, although neither of them contains the detailed transfer function analysis that I just went through. Anyway, I highly recommend checking out these web pages. So here's the schematic of the Vox V847 wall from the ElectroSmash website. The first thing I want to say is don't panic. We will break this down into the important details. The first thing I want to talk about, though, isn't terribly important for what we're about to do, but we should talk about it, and that's the biasing. So for the DC circuit, we get rid of all of the capacitors. So this business goes away. Let's see, this variable resistor, it's between a couple of capacitors, so it's not really relevant anymore, is it? 
So we get rid of all of that. Um, let's see. So the output jack, it doesn't matter. It goes away. We don't need to think about that. Ah, C3, you go away too. We don't want you around here anymore. Let's see. C2 goes away. Go away, go away, go away. All right. And ah, what about L1? Well, L1 is an inductor, and at DC, inductors look like a short circuit. So the inductor turns into a short, so R37 here actually gets shorted out. So maybe what I'll do is I'll take this and I'll copy a version of it. Ah, and let's stick it there. And let's copy and put another version right there like that. Okay, how's that for some image hacking? I wanted to take the time to do that live instead of showing you some sort of cleaned up final result because that's my actual thinking process when looking at a circuit like this. And sometimes I will load up a circuit in something like an image editor and just start hacking at it like this. So given information about the transistors and these particular resistor values in this configuration, you can figure out what the bias voltages are and what the bias currents are. And from those bias currents, you can figure out what the output impedances of the transistors are and what their transconductance gains are. The details of that are not really important for what I want to talk about today. We can just assume that those have been magically given. I just want to talk about the overall structure of this circuit. Now, conveniently, whoever wrote this article wrote some bias voltages in here for us. Actually, who wrote this article? Okay, so I just took a look at the website. And at the bottom here, there's a note about an email address, just info at electrosmash.com. But I can't find any actual authorship information. I guess I should email this address. Anyway, if you are the person who wrote this article, either leave a comment below or maybe send me an email because you are awesome. And I just want to tell you how awesome you are. So as far as Q1 goes, this is a voltage feedback biasing arrangement. So the voltage at the collector more or less gets split down R6 and R8, and whatever results from this voltage divider is fed to the base. Now, there is a small resistance here, R2, and there is some current flowing through the base. So you do get some drop across here, and because there is a current here, you probably don't get a voltage here that's exactly the result from this voltage division. Actually, let's take a look at that. I'm being spontaneous here. All right, so let's try 4.48 volts times 100K divided by 100 plus 470K. So that's 570. So that's 0.786. So it's less than that, 0.722, because there is some current flowing this way. If this was a MOSFET, I would expect much less current to be flowing here, basically zero. So I would expect this voltage to be the same as this voltage, and I would expect this voltage to be closer to this 0.786. So the bias voltage at the base of Q2 is set by the collector of Q1, although, again, because these are BJTs, there is some current flowing through Q2, so there is some voltage lost across this resistor R5, this 470K resistor. So these voltages aren't the same. This one is a bit lower than this one. So earlier I said that the DC circuit wasn't terribly important for what I wanted to talk about in this lecture, and then I just spent a lot of time talking about it. So let's move on. Hmm, it just started storming pretty heavily outside. I wonder if that will show up on the recording. Anyway, now I would like to look at the AC circuit, the small signal circuit. So we're going to short out all of the capacitors except for this one down here. This capacitor C2, that's the one that's part of the HRLC transfer function. That's the important capacitor as far as the varying frequency response goes. So that's the one I'm going to leave in. Now, all of these other capacitors I just shorted are going to have an effect on the frequency response. And especially because they're part of this big feedback loop, they'll have a complicated effect. But I just want to get a high-level sense of how it works, so I'm trying to focus on the most important details for that. And let's see, if I'm doing an AC analysis, I should change this 9 volt to an AC ground. So these are now AC grounds. Now, if C3 is shorted, 
then R8 is shorted out too. So essentially at this node here, you just have ground. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to delete all of the stuff here involving C3 and R8 because that just goes to ground. And then what I need to do is I actually need a little more room. So let me move this up a bit. So now I can take L1 and R7 and move it down here, something like that. And what I'll do is I'll take this line here and I'll move it up here. And let's take this line and move it up here. And let's grab a ground and then stick one of the grounds here. And let's stick another ground here, something like that. Okay, so Q1 and R3 and some associated things, that forms the system that's the multiplication by minus A in our block diagram. This is a common emitter amplifier, so it's an inverting stage. The output of that is then piped to the output jack. Now, it goes through a variable resistor. That corresponds with that lowercase b in the feedback loop. Q2 is an emitter follower that's acting as a voltage buffer, so that voltage gets buffered and placed through C2, R7, and L1, and that's our HRLC transfer function. Wait, actually it's a little bit more complicated because looking this direction, this emitter follower that's driving the circuit is also going to see R2 and R1. So how should we deal with that? Okay, let's use a superposition argument. Looking this direction, we can imagine that R1 is grounded on the other end. And if we assume that R1 is pretty big relative to R2, not a lot of voltage is being dropped across R2 really. So let's ignore it. So really the R in our HRLC would be R7 in parallel with R1. It would see both of those going to ground. And I'm doing that because it makes our lives a whole lot easier if we can ignore R2 there. Okay, that's a lot of stuff. This would be a lot easier to interpret if they implemented this using operational amplifiers, but this is a pretty old circuit, so it doesn't surprise me to see BJTs here. Oh, and there is another complication that I promised I would talk about. Earlier I said that to properly model the circuit, you would also have to stick another transfer function in front. I used a superposition argument to talk about what the voltage looks like at this node going through this Q1 amplifier from the standpoint of the feedback voltage coming from the emitter of Q2. And when I did that, I grounded this input. Now to complete the superposition argument, I have to realize that whatever voltage is coming in through here doesn't just instantaneously pop onto the base of Q1. It's going through the world's most complicated voltage divider. So I have R1 on the top leg of the divider, and then the bottom leg, I have this R2, and then I have this L1 and R7 in parallel to ground. But then it also goes through C2, and then I have R10 to ground in parallel with whatever the small signal impedance looking into the emitter of Q2 is to ground. Uh, I don't feel like thinking about any of that. So imagine you did all of that and you computed some transfer function. So you would stick that in front. The thing is, I strongly suspect that the designers of the circuit weren't thinking in that level of detail at all. They just had an overall sense of the fact that they wanted to put this RLC in this feedback loop and then they set up some resistors to bias it, and then they figured out sort of how they wanted the overall flow to go, and they weren't really worried about reverse engineering the details of it after the fact. They probably just got something going and then tweaked it by ear and worked off of their intuition. And as complicated as all of that was, it all assumed that we had a perfect voltage source for our input. Remember that guitar pickups are high impedance sources. So the fact that the input impedance here is kind of mediocre, there is going to be some current flowing through the base. I have this R2, R7 to ground. I have this L1, all of that business that will give me some reactance to my input impedance. 
The 68K resistor, well, that's not actually terribly high. So this isn't necessarily spectacular, even if you assume that there's no feedback. Now, we previously looked at a use of positive feedback called bootstrapping that improved input impedance, that raised it. The particular kind of negative feedback employed here actually lowers your input impedance. The net effect is that this kind of wah design is considered by some guitarists to suck tone out of their guitars. Now, this effect is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just one of many factors you're balancing when creating your guitar tone. But it looks like this tone suck effect was considered enough of a problem that some wah designs, like this Dunlop crybaby design, include some circuitry to deal with it. So if you take a look at the schematic on the ElectroSmash website, you'll see that the main part of the circuit is basically a copy of the Vox design. There's a few different values for a few different components, but it's basically the same thing. The main thing that they've added is this voltage buffer in front with this emitter follower right here. The analysis of the schematics in this lecture was fairly messy because it involved a lot of raw transistors. If you want to learn more about that and you're a Georgia Tech student, I recommend taking ECE 3400 Analog Electronics. ECE 3400 used to be called ECE 3050, and I strongly recommend that everybody check out Marshall Leach's ECE 3050 web pages. There is a lot of really, really fantastic stuff here. Marshall also has a page on using superposition with dependent sources on his website. This is something that most textbooks tell you you can't do. You can, you just have to be very careful while doing it. The main catch is that you can't solve for your controlling variable until you have all of the contributions included. In case you're wondering about my thinking about superposition when looking at the Vox circuit, that's where I'm coming from. A quick note to my students, if you didn't follow a lot of the details there, don't worry about it. I'm not sure I followed all of the details either. And if I give you a homework problem on this, I will step through it in detail and give you a lot of explicit instruction about what assumptions I want you to make. Okay, I think that was the longest lecture I've made so far. If you survived all the way to this point in the lecture, Thank you for sticking around. It's now thundering outside, so this is probably a good time to wrap it up.